everybody. Here is an episode from our 10-episode playlist that we're calling Offbeat History. Yeah, we're adding this to our, our regular publishing schedule as one kind of big drop all at the same time on uh, March 19th. And that is so that you maybe have a little bit of extra entertainment options available to you, particularly if you are self-quarantined or sheltering in place. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy B. Wilson. And this is the continuing story of the attempt to bring hippos to the U.S. as a livestock animal. Uh, And in the first part of this two-parter, we talked about the meat shortage in the U.S. in the early 1900s that initiated this Uh, desire to brainstorm new animals that might fill in that meat gap. Uh, And we talked a lot about one of the men in particular who worked to bring hippos from Africa, who was Frederick Burnham. And today we're going to pick up with another man who was brought onto the project uh, by Louisiana Representative Robert Broussard. And then we will discuss how all these men worked together and what happened to this hippo plan. So there's a little uncertainty about exactly when Frederick Duquesne was born. Allegedly, it was December 21st, 1877, in the Cape Colony in South Africa. There's some confusion in part because his life was more like a series of concocted details and varying identities. Almost all of his biography comes with question marks. Even his physical description shifts depending on the source. His hair color is pretty universally described as dark although sometimes dark means black and sometimes it means brown. Likewise, his eye color is sometimes brown and sometimes blue and sometimes hazel, depending on who's doing the telling. Yeah, he's. we've talked about con men before and how it's often difficult to pin down their biographical details, and he definitely falls in line with that whole system. Um, his father was a hunter, and he was often away from the family. And so his mother and his blind uncle Jan raised him for the most part. And during his youth, he watched as hippo carcasses were butchered for meat. uh, And he and the other kids would collect the unused fat to sell to soap makers from France. See how everything's connected? Again, I didn't mean to connect to our bodies turning to soap episode, but I kind of do on that one by accident. Duquesne was in Belgium in military school in 1899 when his family sent for him to come home. He was needed to serve in the Boer military in the Second Boer War. So at this point, the Boers were being run into prison camps by British forces, and the homes that they were forced out of were being destroyed. It's estimated that at their fullest, these prison camps contained 160,000 Boers, 25,000 of whom did not survive the ordeal. To deal with being vastly outnumbered by the British forces, The Boer military, which was pretty ragtag, took to a more guerrilla approach to warfare. Duquesne really excelled at this looser, more stealthy style, and he wound up working as a military courier. This conflict could be its own episode easily, but during this conflict, the British warfare tactics against the Boers were brutal and horrifying, and Duquesne's family was not immune. His father had died not long after Fritz had been called to war, and Duquesne eventually learned that British troops had brutalized and murdered his uncle that had helped raise him, and his sister as well, and that they had brutalized and kidnapped his mother. Disguised as a British soldier, Duquesne found his mother in a concentration camp. She was, at this point, barely clinging to life. Uh, She had an infant with her that was conceived with one of her captors who had raped her. Both of them were suffering from syphilis to a point that they were too far gone to be saved. Uh, So they were basically dying the most horrible way imaginable. And this, not surprisingly, is believed to have significantly hardened Duquesne. This event really is always pointed out as like the moment where he shut down a little bit. He became a, a much colder human being at this point. Despite being captured on several occasions, there were two documented and then more were suspected He always managed to escape, although one of his escape attempts involved using a spoon to dig a tunnel in a wall, only to have the wall collapse and pin him there when he tried to go out the tunnel he had dug. There's also a tale that during one of his stints as a captive, he managed to seduce the jailer's daughter. Yeah, basically everything you might read in like a a penny novel of the time happened to him. 
So again, we don't, these are largely his accounts, so we don't know how much of it's true and how much of it isn't. But both of those are fun to think about. Uh, Duquesne's biggest escape, though, which is said to have happened after he was captured while plotting a particularly massive explosion, was actually orchestrated through Morse code. He collaborated using the code with prisoners that were in other cells. Uh, These men, there were three of them all together, jumped into the sea. They were still bound at this point, and they managed to live on the run for several weeks before they reached a port town where Duquesne actually became a pimp for a brief while. Again, his story is so wacky. Uh, He only had that job for about a week, just long enough so that he could steal the identity of one of the Johns involved in this prostitution plan and set sail for the U.S. under that assumed name. Duquesne's charm was so effective that he ended up, after a time, becoming an advisor to President Theodore Roosevelt on a plan to travel to Africa and hunt wild game. Once he had rubbed elbows at the White House, he used that credential to bolster his image and his career. At first, he wrote newspaper columns about the president's trip, and then he turned his position and started writing smear pieces about how Roosevelt was actually a pampered tourist. He even went so far as to try to have the president prevented from returning to the United States by suggesting that he was going to bring back a deadly contagious disease. Yeah, it seems like Duquesne was not so much about loyalty as he was about maximizing his own benefit in any given situation, and this is just one example. Uh, And around this same time, conman Fritz had also started up a one-man touring stage show, and this was called East Africa, the Wonderland of Roosevelt's Hunt. So he was still trying to capitalize on kind of the fervor and excitement around this trip Roosevelt was taking. And it's actually because of this one-man show that Louisiana Representative Broussard found him. So at this point, as you may recall from our first episode in this uh, two-parter, at this point, the U.S. was dealing with what they called the meat question, which was how were they going to feed all of these people that had immigrated into the U.S. and the bolstering population as they were running out of meat. And this meat question, as it was called in the press, really threatened to chip away at the idea that the U.S. could sustain its own people and continue to grow Uh, You know, it was kind of a point of pride as well as being an issue just of survival for a lot of people. And so Representative Broussard, like many other politicians, really wanted to solve this food gap problem. Once the idea of introducing hippos to the South came up, Broussard sent a field agent to survey the Louisiana swampland and give an assessment about how viable it was going to be to introduce hippos into that environment. The report was titled Why and How to Place Hippopotamus in the Louisiana Lowlands, and it indicated that the swamps would provide a great environment for hippos. It was actually estimated by an official at the Agricultural Department that a herd of hippos eating through the swamp's free range would produce an estimated million tons of meat each year. Word also circulated that hippo meat was delicious as well as potentially plentiful, particularly the brisket area. So just in case anyone doesn't know cuts of meat, uh, the brisket is normally a cut of meat from the lower chest of an animal. And the New York Times dubbed these proposed cuts of hippo meat from this brisket area as lake cow bacon. So Representative Broussard was winning people over with this idea. His supporters really thought it was an ingenious solution to the whole multiple problems it was set out to address. A lot of them volunteered to help with capture and transport of these beasts. He had not only come up with a plan that seemed like it could solve the meat shortage and the water hyacinth problem, but it also appealed to the sense of American pride and problem solving. So the whole can-do attitude. Of this hippo plan, Lippincott's monthly magazine wrote, quote, This animal, homely as a steamroller, is the embodiment of salvation. Peace, plenty, and contentment lie before us, and a new life with new experiences, new opportunities, new vigor, new romance, folded in that golden future when the meadows and the bayous of our southern lands shall swarm with herds of hippopotami. Like, have you seen a hippopotamus? I know. It sounds so idyllic. (laughs) It does. It's homely as a steamroller that is going to charge your face and trample you to death. (laughs) 
Yeah, they they were under the mistaken impression that they were very docile. No, no. Right? Because they're big and lumbering in most depictions. If you've ever seen a hippo run, it's terrifying. But in most depictions, you see them kind of floating in the water looking very chill. I think that led people to believe. Yeah, if, if there with were... With some false testimony along the way, <laughs> that they were going to be completely easy to handle. If there were an award for, like, the the most angry, dangerous herbivores... I think it might go to to hippos. So, in March 1910, a bill was introduced in the U.S. House of Representatives called H.R. 23261 by Broussard. This bill proposed that $250,000 be appropriated to import animals into the United States for useful purposes. It came to be known as the Hippo Bill. With Burnham's influence, the bill was endorsed by former President Teddy Roosevelt and prominent news outlets, which included the New York Times, were praising the hippo concept. Plans for hippo ranching were starting to gain serious support. Mutual friends connected Broussard, uh, who was called Cousin Bob by his constituents, uh, with Burnham. And the men first met the morning that the bill was introduced for discussion. And Burnham had previously attempted to secure funding for an animal import project of his own, like completely separate from this. But it actually got bogged down by politicking in Washington. But now Burnham felt like with Broussard, he had a political ally and they might actually get some traction. When Burnham spoke to the congressional committee, he urged them to consider the fact that most of the animals Americans eat were imported from Europe, with the exception of the turkey. So why should hippos be seen any differently? He felt like after the initial adjustment, hippo meat would come to seem just as natural a part of the North American diet as beef or chicken. I have to admit, when I read that during my research, it gave me such a giggle. Like, just the thought of, of course hippos are a natural part of our lives, (laughs) because they're so not. Additionally, Burnham pointed out that other seemingly exotic animals uh, had been imported in more recent times, such as ostriches, he actually brought up the camels that we talked about in our U.S. Camel Corps episode. And to bolster the argument that imported animals, no matter how alien they may initially seem to the U.S., often fared well once they were imported, uh, he mentioned that he himself had seen camels. These were the offspring of those that had been part of the abandoned military plan to use them, uh, thriving on their own in the American Southwest. So to Burnham, this absolutely sealed the case. It provided clear evidence that adaptation of imported animals was absolutely possible and even highly likely beyond what we expected. I guess they were not really aware of what was happening with rabbits in Australia. (laughs) So Duquesne's testimony before the committee was more theatrical. Here's how it opened. Quote, I am as much one of the African animals as the hippopotamus. End quote. He told the hearing that hippos were easy to raise and domesticate and that they were perfect animals for livestock and that the meat was delicious. So obviously we know that this is, a lot of it is false. Uh, Hippos are widely regarded as one of the most dangerous species in Africa. He also suggested numerous other animals they could consider importing from Africa, including giraffes and elephants. So between Burnham's confident logical approach to the issue at hand and Duquesne's enthusiastic flair and alleged expertise in handling wild animals, the hearing really convinced a lot of people that hippo ranching had a very real future in the United States. So the two men traveled to Louisiana with Broussard to discuss next steps so that they could set up the New Food Society. Despite having been enemies literally assigned with killing one another during wartime, the pair of them uh, seem to have a a lot of respect for one another, and they were really united by this one common hippo goal. Yeah, a lot of accounts will say that um, Burnham really felt like Duquesne had gotten kind of a, a raw deal out of life, and that if he could kind of help him along this path of kind of like legitimate enterprise, that he would help make a better man out of him, and he could really help him turn his life around. But, of course, he was a flim flam man. And even during this, um, as evidenced by the fact that he was talking about how incredibly easy it is to domesticate hippos. Uh, at some point while they were forming this new society, uh, 
an inventor named Elliot Lord joined the group. Uh, It's unclear how this exactly happened, how he became part of it. And there's some speculation that he kind of just managed to insert himself into what had been a trio with no invite at all. He does seem to have rubbed Burnham the wrong way, in part because he wanted to go immediately to potential financial backers asking for money, whereas Burnham wanted to take a little time before doing that and put together a full, detailed plan for what they were then calling the New Food Supply Society before they started asking people to donate. He did not want his friends and associates, because it was a lot of people that Burnham knew that they were going to be approaching, to feel pressured to buy into something that wasn't thought through and could potentially cave in its infancy and basically be throwing their money away. During a lecture at the Humane Association of California, Burnham's desire for a clear plan was really apparent. He said, quote, Let us not make the same mistakes again. This nation has reached a stage in its development where we should take stock of our assets and make full use of them in an intelligent manner. The country had really overused its resources as it established and then overthrottled the beef industry. So with the HIPPO plan, Burnham was insistent that a more careful strategy should be established from the very outset. Now, if you have ever been part of a startup or a fledgling project that had difficulty getting off the ground, the way things start to play out at this point uh, may sound very familiar. These four men all had very different approaches to this new venture, and it caused a lot of problems. Elliot Lord seemed to want to do a lot of glad-handing and hustling for backers without much in the way of actual money materializing from these efforts. Duquesne was writing article after article about African animals and their adaptability, and he felt like he was the only one doing any real work, and he was doing it at his own expense, so he started to feel put upon about it which is very funny to me because he was making things up. (laughs) Yeah, it wasn't like he was spending a lot of time on research. No, he also grew frustrated that some papers were crediting other men for this idea, and he wanted to get the attribution, especially because he felt like it was his personality that had given the hippo plan real credibility. Yeah, he wanted pretty much all of the credit, even though really he was just kind of a jazz hander in that whole group. Uh, Burnham, meanwhile, was speaking with colleagues. He was giving occasional talks about organizing the New Food Supply Society, and he kept trying to stay positive, but he was really getting frustrated at the lack of real progress as well. And he even kind of sympathized with Duquesne and was like, I know, this is not going the way we thought. Uh, And Broussard, who, you know, had initially put this whole thing together, seemed to be really busy with politics. So... He would answer queries from Burnham, uh, but he would simply tell him that nothing was really happening yet. He was still laying groundwork. He was no real progress had materialized. Burnham went to Washington in early spring of 1911 to talk to Broussard about reintroducing the hippo bill. As part of the plan, Burnham would go to Africa once again to look for suitable animals and gain additional information to help build out the plan. But he never made the trip because the revolution in Mexico meant he had to drop everything and look after some other business dealings there. Yeah, just as Burnham's other work called him away from the hippo plan, the other men that were involved in this project eventually got absorbed in their other activities as well. The hippo bill was never like the entire focus of any of their work or lives. You know, they all still had other things going on the side. So in short... The whole thing just kind of fizzled out. I would like to say, thank goodness. (laughs) Just because based on, like, I don't actually know whether hippos would wind up flourishing in the the southeastern United States, but based on other efforts to do things by introducing non-native species, I just imagine a giant barrier wall walling off all of what used to be Louisiana And possibly adjacent states also with, like, a big sign saying Louisiana is overrun with hippos that will kill you. (laughs) I feel like you're going to have hippo nightmares after this. I might, but first we're going to have a break for a word from a sponsor. While things had kind of fizzled out. That's not really the end of the story. Um, As his focus on setting up the new food supply society waned, 
Frederick Burnham uh, worked in Mexico. He was setting up copper mines and other projects before he moved to Tulare County, California, for a quieter life than Pasadena offered. Uh, Pasadena had been quiet when he and his wife first moved there, but eventually it grew into a bigger town, and he didn't like that. He wanted to live out in the middle of nowhere. So he also became heavily involved in the preparedness movement. Duquesne had been a very busy man, both before and after the Hippo Bill initiative ground to a halt. So, as we mentioned earlier, he was a con man, and that kept him busy for a while. Yeah, in addition to using his connection to the Hippo Bill to get funding for a variety of ventures, uh, from things like banquet events where he would speak about his knowledge of African animals, uh, to trying to stage a trip to South America where he would film uh, and then return to the U.S. to make it into a multimedia event detailing his trip. He basically was just trying to parlay his connection to all of these people into more activities and money for himself. The start of World War I really shifted Duquesne's alias work into high gear. He was in South America when the war broke out with his wife, and he sent her home to the States. He still held a firm hatred for Britain left over from the Second Boer War and the destruction of his family. So he thought the U.S. should join forces with Germany to crush Britain. And if the U.S. wouldn't, he would do his part to bring his sworn enemy down. It's a whole other story that could easily be its own episode, but he basically assumed more than a dozen other identities as he attempted to sabotage Britain using his explosives knowledge. Yeah, he was busy. He was had some connections with the Germans, um, was basically on kind of a, a revenge trip still based on that previous uh, war that he was part of. And his work led him eventually to being wanted for murder by Great Britain. So he did the only sensible thing for a con man and he faked his own death. <laughs> he basically planted the story in the media using one of his aliases as a byline, and he like sent this in as a freelance writer. So it got picked up and reported. But then he decided pretty quickly after that that he actually didn't want to be dead. So he instead made up a crazy story that kind of painted him as this hero and that he survived this attack. And no, no, we thought he was dead, but really he barely survived. Duquesne was finally arrested in New York for insurance fraud in late 1917. Burnham had been consulted by police when they realized that the man they were hunting had worked with him and Broussard on the hippo bill. There is so much more to both Burnham and Duquesne's stories. Each of these men, as I've said a couple times, could easily be an episode on their own. And they very well may be at some point because, like, seriously, Duquesne even ran a spy ring in World War II. There is a lot to talk about with both of these gents. But back to hippos, uh, now we have plenty of meat in the United States, and we don't have hippos. So how did that happen? So eventually, the idea that people had been focusing on for such a long time of bringing in non-native species into a space that couldn't be farmed through tr traditional means, i.e. these swamplands, was replaced by the idea of landscape engineering. So instead of finding uses for seemingly unfarmable land, uh, agricultural industry found ways to turn that land into usable pastures and feedlots. As for the water hyacinth that the hippos were supposed to be eating, that is still a problem. Cool temperatures outside of the south keep it from spreading quite as far, but in the country's more warm, moist areas in the south, it has to be really carefully managed. Uh, and Frederick Russell Burnham eventually died of a heart attack in 1947. He was 86 at the time. And Duquesne died in 1956 at the age of 78. Yeah, after he had done a stint in prison. Like I said, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of interesting tales that go along with those two men, and uh, I actually hope to tell them at some point in time. Thank you so much for joining us today for this classic. If you have heard any kind of email address or maybe a Facebook URL during the course of the episode, that might be obsolete. It might be doubly obsolete because we have changed our email address again. You can now reach us at historypodcasts at iheartradio.com and we're all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. 
Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.